you should know that I asked I asked Connor to come to speak here about maybe six months ago, or at least six months ago. And as you know, uh, in the meantime, all of last week, RTE had a whole week of programs on uh, on climate change. So I hope you you appreciate how how influential we were in arranging this uh, RTE. Uh, just before, as a curtain raiser for Connor's uh, lecture tonight. Uh, now, um, I just so I'll just introduce Connor very quickly. He's a, Connor is a graduate of Maynooth University, and he's a senior lecturer in geography, my old department of geography in, in Maynooth, and he's also a member of the uh, Icarus, which is the Irish Climatic Analysis and Research Unit, and that features regularly on uh, on radio and television. People in uh, research people in the in Icarus feature regularly talking about climate change, so it's an important unit. So we're delighted to have Connor. Connor's a hydroclimatologist, I think that's the, the scientific term, a hydroclimatologist uh, who specializes particularly in uh, flooding and, and so on. So wet and windy, uh, the wet and windy weather is one of his specialities. He's currently working with the Office of Public Works and Irish Water to develop uh, stress testing design approaches to, for flood defenses and and critical infrastructure and projections of climate change in the future. He sit, he's sitting, he's a member of the Climate Change Advisory Council, uh, which, uh, which meets regularly at a big big table somewhere in Dublin to discuss oncoming storms and, 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 and climate crises like that. He's a course director for the Masters, uh, and Masters of Science and Climate Change in Maynooth University, and he's also involved in, in a Masters program delivered with colleagues in, Zam in Zambia and Malawi. So I'm delighted that we have Connor here to talk to us tonight, and uh, I hope you give him a, a welcome. Thank you. And you Thank don't you very much, them. Buddy, and, um, okay. Very delighted to be here, um, and especially at the behest of Professor Paddy Duffy. Um, he's the founding member of our Department of Geography, and we owe an awful lot to his energy and vision. So when Paddy asks you to come to Westport, you go to Westport. <laughs> um, I want to talk about climate change uh, for the next 50 minutes or so, and I want to tell you a story in terms of how global climate is changing, how Irish climate is changing, indeed how local climate is changing, and what the outlook is for the future. I want to leave, I don't want to depress you in terms of giving negative stories, I want to leave this with um, some opportunis, opportunities and optimism for the future, but at the same time to give you a reality in terms of the changes that are happening across different parts of the climate system and to extreme events here locally. I'll talk to us if you want to stop me at any point, feel free, but uh, wait for the end, I'm happy to ask questions, so we'll take it as it goes, and it's not going to be too technical, lots of pictures, and I'll do lots of explanation as we go. So the whole issue around climate change starts with what we call an enhanced greenhouse effect. We have a natural greenhouse effect on this planet that makes it habitable, gives us the, the climate that we're used to, an average temperature that is seeing the, the evolution of of mammals and the world that we have around us. And we've, under, we've understood very well what the natural greenhouse effect is for a very long time, getting all the way back to the early 1800s and work by people like Jean Baptiste Fourier, and even work by Irish scientists back in the 1860s, people like John Tyndall, who understood and were the first to understand how important greenhouse gases are in the atmosphere. Gases like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, mm. and the role that they play in absorbing radiation, heat radiation from the earth, re-emitting it back to the surface to increase our, our surface temperatures. Without the natural greenhouse effect, Earth's average temperature would be about nine, minus 19 degrees. So these trace gases in the atmosphere are crucially important for giving us the ambient temperature that allows us to survive. But the challenge is, over the last couple of hundred years, uh, particularly since the onset of the Industrial Revolution, we have been increasing the amount of those gases in the atmosphere, particularly carbon dioxide from the burning of uh, fossil fuels and combustion. And we can see really clearly, if we have a look back at these long reconstructions, this is carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere, going back all the way over the last 1,000 years or so. You may ask, how can we know this? Uh, scientists go to glaciers and ice uh, dome in, in Greenland, they can take samples of that ice, have a look at little bubbles of air trapped within it, 
and derive the concentration of these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere at those times. And the natural background concentration of carbon dioxide is about 280 parts per million in the atmosphere. And you can see what happens from the period of the Industrial Revolution onto present and the exponential increase that we've seen in terms of the concentration of carbon dioxide in that case in the atmosphere. More recently, we have these very precise observations that are taken from Mauna Loa in Hawaii. This is a very famous graph. It's known as the Keeling Curve. And it shows us the, the annual cycle of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from the late 1950s up to present. And you can see clearly that on an annual basis, we have this sawtooth shape. And that's the, the greening of vegetation globally, which takes in carbon dioxide during the summer, boreal summer period. And you can see that cycle in our measurements. But you also see the trend there, which is uh, an increasing trend continuing to go up where we are now past 415 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Remember that background concentration, the natural concentration is about 280 parts per million. And we often really underestimate, I guess is the word I would use, the importance of these gases. So I've, I've told you about the natural greenhouse effect, how we've enhanced it, but this video is just a visualization of carbon dioxide emissions globally over the year 2006. And as it has been cycling through, you can see very clearly how important if we were to, to try and visualize carbon dioxide and emissions globally, how much we are actually putting up there into the atmosphere. And obviously, the more greenhouse gases we emit into the atmosphere, the greater we are likely to impact on global temperatures. This animation, you can watch it as it goes by and explain what it's showing, and you can watch it again, because I think it's a very powerful graphic that distills and communicates how much global temperatures have changed. Each of these circles represent uh, how warm or cold an individual year is relative to average. The average is the period 1951 to 1980, where it's a small circle, it's close to the average, where it's a big circle, it's further away from the average. Red is hot, blue is cold. And you can see as we cycle through the years, from the period from about, I'll do that again, from about 1880 onwards, when we have observed temperature records globally, for each country in the world, you can see the flickering of each year, variability from warm and cold, but as we get into the 1970s, how persistent and spatially consistent the warming trend has been. This is Ireland over here, if you want to keep an eye on us, that we are part of the globe, we are experiencing the warming. We've seen the Earth warm by over one degree Celsius since pre-industrial time, and Irish temperature increases have been about the same. So the warmest year that we've experienced was 2016, 2017 is not too far behind it, and 2019 is likely to be up there as well. This is the same information graphed for the entire planet, Earth's average climate, uh, taken by scientists in the UK. And you can see here is a representation of average temperatures, which is taken as 1961 to 1990. And each year is a, plotted as above or below that average. And again, we can see from the 1970s onwards that we're on this continuing increase towards consistently warmer temperatures <coughs> since the 1970s. That's 2016, this is 20, uh, 2017, and 2019 is back to be somewhere in there. So we're seeing that continuation of that consistent increase in trend in global temperature. And lots of scientists have been looking at different ways we can help communicate that, because showing a graph like that to the public can often turn them off. This is one of my favorite representations of global temperature increases uh, produced by a colleague in the University of Reading called Ed Hawkins. Unfortunately, it's cut off the red at the end, which takes away from its effect a bit. But you can see very clearly how different or how unusual the most recent decades have been. For people like me, who born in the 1970s, each decade has been consistently warmer than has been consistently warmer as we've progressed. And to show again using these temperature stripes, these are for all countries in the world, that it's not just a local phenomenon. It's not just one place that's heating up. This is a global phenomenon that all parts, all countries of the world are increasing in terms of their temperature. The darker the reds, the greater the temperature difference for any one country. From Asia and the Middle East, the Pacific region, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. 
So we have the observations, we have the evidence that temperatures are increasing and we know that it is us that is causing it. It's our increases in greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. <coughs> in terms of where it's warm the most, if we look at the distribution of the warming that's happened, it has been particularly land masses in the northern hemisphere, but particularly the Arctic region as a whole has warmed far in excess of any other part of the globe. The dark red colours here, these are uh, degrees Fahrenheit on the top, <laughs> degrees Celsius. These darker red colours are representing over four degrees Celsius warming since uh, the period 1880 relative to 2014 to 2018. So we're seeing dramatic changes happening at high latitudes in the Arctic. And of course, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. What happens here affects storms, affects uh, weather patterns that we get in the mid latitudes that can affect Ireland. Similarly, when we say that the world has warmed one degree Celsius, on average, when you distribute that average, it's very uneven. The greatest warming is in land masses. Where we live, the great least warming has been over the oceans, which have a, take a lot more energy to warm up than catch up. But at the moment, it's land where we live has increased the most. And it's the same when we talk about the future later on. It's the land where we live is likely to experience greatest warming. When you hear two degree average, doesn't mean everywhere at two degrees, it means an average of two degrees. So temperatures are increasing. What about other measurements? We don't base our conclusions just on temperature alone. We also see that ice is melting across the globe. Up on the top left hand side is the mass balance of Greenland. It's the, the balance, if you like, between melting and accumulation of ice over that ice sheet. <coughs> and you can see very clearly what's happening here towards a decreasing trend <coughs> until we get to about the year 2000 and we've seen a step change in the, in the retreat of the Greenland glaciers, the, the Greenland ice mass since about the year 2000. If we go to the South Pole and have a look at Antarctica, you see that different regions of the Antarctic uh, continent are some parts in the East Antarctic are accumulating ice, but the Antarctic Peninsula and in particularly the West Antarctic ice sheet are experiencing dramatic reductions in uh, mass balance. And of course, these have implications for sea level rise. The processes that are driving sea level rise are loss of ice from particularly these two ice sheets, but also warming of ocean waters as water warms and expands. And it's not just the big ice sheets, it's also the world's glaciers. These are reconstructions of relative glacier lengths across the world, um, getting back over thousands of years. And you can see how presently we're looking at expanding glaciers and then we have this precipitous drop uh, around the recent decades or recent hundred years or so where we've seen a dramatic decline in the average length of glaciers globally. So the earth is warming, temperatures are increasing, and the cryosphere of frozen parts of the world are responding accordingly. It's not just land-based ice. We're very familiar and you may have heard in the media about how Arctic sea ice is decreasing. This is a little animation that shows sea ice thickness from the early 1980s to present, when we have satellite information, and you can see where you, what you want to see are lots of these yellow colors, which represent sea ice that's healthy and well accumulated. What we see are more of these dark <coughs> colors, which is the absence of sea ice, and very thin or poorly constructed, poorly accumulated sea ice. So major changes happening here that are important again for our weather in the mid latitudes, but also crucially for ecosystems, wildlife in that part of the world. As well as ice changing, our oceans are also warming. We can see the evidence of change from our ocean measurements. And it's not just the ocean surface waters that are warming, it's the ocean is warming to depth that, that we can get down to. So again, these are plots, these lines on the graph show ocean warming at different levels. The blue line is the surface, the red line is depth of 700 to 1,000 meters, and this is a combination of the two, which shows overall ocean heat content over a period of the last 60, 70 years or so. But what's particularly important to note is while we have seen an increase in global temperatures of one degree Celsius, our air temperatures, over 90% of the additional energy that's been made available to the Earth as a result of enhanced climate, or enhanced uh, greenhouse effect, most of the energy has been taken up by the oceans. So to heat the oceans, most of the additional energy from greenhouse gas emissions is currently going to the oceans. We're only seeing 10% of that that's gone to increasing global air temperatures by one degree Celsius. 
In addition, sea level is rising. So the combination of melting of land-based ice and also the warming of the global oceans is causing water to expand and the amount of water in the ocean to increase. And we've seen that sea levels have increased and current sea levels are unusual, at least in the context of the last 3,000 years. And again, when we look at vegetation, plants are responding. These are two iconic data sets from different parts of the world. The one on your left hand side is the cherry blossom uh, date, the peak bloom in Kyoto in Japan, but going back over centuries, all the way back to the year 200, people in Kyoto were noting the timing of when peak blooming of the cherry blossom was happening. And we can see over time how that varies naturally. And then we get this early blooming as a result of increasing temperatures in recent decades. And similarly, if we come to uh, uh, with France and the grape harvest uh, in Bordeaux, you can see clearly what's happening here in terms of the date of grape harvest. And again, in the last number of decades, a consistently earlier harvesting of the grape as a result of increased temperatures and conditions that give rise to, to earlier development of the grape harvest. And this is just two representative time series. The global terrestrial ecosystems and biosphere are also responding. So change is happening to all parts of the Earth's climate system, from weather variables, temperatures, to sea ice, to how the ecosystems are responding. So to finish this component of the global picture, climate change is happening, it's unequivocal. And the key changes and key indicators across the atmosphere, the oceans, the frozen parts of the world, the biosphere, these changes are happening at rates that are unprecedented since at least the last deglaciation. And most key indicators that we use to monitor the health of the Earth system are now in states unseen for centuries through to many millennia. So change is happening, it's unequivocal, and that change is impressive in its scale. So the question, how do we know it's us? Well, we don't have another planet that we can do experiments on to say, well, let's not emit greenhouse gases and see what happens. So we have to use computer models for this kind of experiment. And we can take our observations this black line is our global mean temperature records getting back to over the last more than 100 years. And we can take climate models that represent our understanding of how the climate system works, that are represented on computers that we can make changes to and see what happens in, in terms of the global climate system. And if we are to just take natural factors, those factors that affect climate naturally, that create cycles in the weather and climate over many decades and centuries, this is the green line that we see. And you can see very clearly that it's a decent match to the observations until we get to about here, and then there's a divergence between the two. So natural factors that influence climate cannot explain the warming that we've seen <coughs> in global temperature records. It is only when we include human contributions to emissions of greenhouse gases with those normal or natural conditions that we're able to explain the observations. So that's essentially the smoking gun of how we know it's us that is changing or that are changing the climate. It's only by accounting for human activities globally that we can explain the increases in temperature that we've seen globally. And Ireland's climate is also changing. So you saw in the very first animation that I showed you, Ireland is there as part of that global community of temperature increase. This is our warming stripe. As we get down to more regional basis, like in Ireland, you do see some bit more variability, like some warm years here and some here. But overall, we see this trend towards warmer temperatures at the end of this record. And again, the end of the record is about here and orange until we get there. And Irish temperatures have increased by just under one degree Celsius since the pre since pre-industrial period. So very much in line with what's happening globally. If we zoom in on the west of Ireland, this is representative of Galway and Mayo that I took from the Carbon Brief website. Who, uh, it's a very interesting scientific blog around issues around climate change, but they have this wonderful uh, resource where you can map temperature change anywhere in the world and look at projections of future temperature change. So I just pulled out for the west of Ireland, and this is the temperature increase that we've seen. This is the observations relative to 1961 to 1990 and it warmed by about 0.78 degrees Celsius in this part of the west of Ireland. And these are projections for the future out to 2100. I'll come back to these 
futures and the decisions that we have in terms of which one of these pathways we follow into the future, that's a decision that's in our hands and a decision that we can make as a, a global community. What about rainfall in Ireland? Well, we get lots of it, we do know that, and we have been recording lots of it for a very long time. Uh, this is a picture of the archives of rainfall records that were held in Glen <coughs> Aaron in last night in Dublin. And we have records in Ireland that are available for all parts of Ireland back to 1940, but before that, all of our data is held on these paper records. So we've been working in Maynooth with students in our undergraduate class and anybody we can drag into the process of trying to get this data off of that paper onto our computers so we can analyze the data. And over that last four years, we've rescued in excess of 1.5 million days of rainfall records from across Ireland. That gives us some of the longest rainfall records anywhere in the world. I want to show you what it tells us about how Irish rainfall is changing. <coughs> so this is a rainfall record that dates all the way back to 1711. It is one of the longest continuous rainfall records anywhere in the world. And what that line is plotting is how wet or dry every decade, every 10 year period is. So it's taking 10 year steps and plotting them as they move along. Starting in 1711, you can see we have a really dry year here, which is 1741, lean on air for the historians among you, uh, which was the, the forgotten famine driven by extremely cold conditions in 1741. And even in Maynooth, where Paddy brought us on field trips to Castletown, with Connolly's folly who built at this point uh, as a public works to do with the family. So we get all the way back to there, but the, the picture that we get here is towards wetter conditions. And as we get to the end of the series, particularly from the 1900s onwards, we see this increasing trend to the point where the last 10 years has been the wettest in more than, well, in at least 300 years, back to 1711. So that discussion is in that article that you can read on the RTE website. And when we look at rainfall extremes, we expect that as the atmosphere warms, it holds more moisture. And for every one degree increase in temperature we get, we expect to see a 7% increase in rainfall intensity. So again, we've been looking at observations to ask the question, how has rainfall intensity been changing? So that's what R20 millimeters just read rainfall intensity. And this is for winter, this is for summer. The blue is increasing, the red is decreasing. And you can see very clearly in winter, we've seen increases in rainfall intensity in that half of the island, in the northwestern half, and decreases in the southeastern half. But look at what's happening in summer in particular, where you see those white triangles there, statistically significant, I won't get into the detail, but that's what we're looking for, towards the southeast of the country, particularly in summer, intensity, uh, about equivalent to that 7%, which is equivalent with the warming that we've seen, which is consistent with what we expect in a warming world. And again, because we have these really long records, we can have a look back and ask how memorable extreme events have been changing over the course of the observations. Prior to 20, well, even since, last summer was particularly dry, but it didn't quite beat 1995 as the driest summer in Ireland. When we have a look over the records of rainfall that we have, this case back to 1900, this is 1995, and the likelihood of a summer as dry as 1995 has more than doubled over the course of the last 120 years or so. Our hottest summer was also 1995, and the warming trend that we've seen in Ireland means that the likelihood of a summer as hot as 1995 has increased 50 fold since 1900. This is our wettest winter. Our wettest winter is now, this paper was written in 2014, and then along came Storm Desmond in 2015. So Storm Desmond is now our Winter 2015-16 is now our wettest winter, but before that was 94-95. And over the period of record, we've seen again a doubling of the likelihood of a winter as wet as our wettest winter on record. So we are seeing these changes that are happening in terms of summer, in terms of precipitation and temperature here in Ireland. So what about other extremes like <coughs> floods? Well, on a global scale, if we step back up a bit, We've seen an increase in heavy precipitation events, rainfall intensity and heavy rainfall events throughout many parts of the world, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere around Europe. We've seen drought increases in the Mediterranean and West Africa. We've seen drought decreases in other parts of the world. We've seen heat waves increase in terms of their magnitude and duration. 
We've seen some of the, the hurricanes that happen in the North Atlantic that affect Florida and the United States increase in their intensity, and we've seen the number of cold days and nights decrease globally. When it comes to thinking about flood events, we've done some work recently about looking at the changes that we've seen in both the timing and the size and the magnitude of flood events. These represent changes in the timing of floods, where you see the red colors, floods are happening earlier in the year, where you see the blue colors, they're happening later in the year. So in Ireland, we're kind of split in two here. The western half of the country, storms are happening later in the year. In the eastern side of the country, they're happening earlier in the year for two different important reasons that are behind the mechanisms that drive the floods. We've seen later storms occurring over the last 50 years or so, affecting the west of Ireland, which is the main flood generating mechanism. And we've seen that intense rainfall in the southeast of Ireland that creates saturated soils earlier in the year. So we can explain these through climate processes and link them to what's going on in the atmosphere. And we've been able to follow that up recently by looking at how the size of floods are changing. And we've seen again different parts of Europe responding differently. The size of floods are decreasing in parts of Central Europe. As a result, these are snow melt driven. Uh, these are decreases in floods in Southern Europe, again because of changes in rainfall and drier conditions in Southern Europe, we've seen a decrease in floods. But in part of Northwestern Europe and the British and Irish Isles, we see these blue colors which represent an increase in the magnitude of floods. So in the context of Europe and the changes in floods that we've seen, we call Northwestern Europe, the British and Irish Isles, a flood hotspot. And there are big changes. And they're big in terms of the flood defenses that have been built. For example, we talk about floods in terms of how often we might expect them to occur. Back in 1960, the 100-year flood uh, has now become, by the end of this record, where you see these darker colors, the equivalent of the flood you'd expect once every 50 years. And that has important implications then when it comes to flood defenses and flood risk and flood exposure. So we're seeing changes in the occurrence of extremes. And we're able to understand the impact that humans are having on these extreme events. So this is a representation of the summer 2018 heat wave over Europe. This is shown the maximum temperatures over three or four days. And you can see very clearly the fingerprint of temperature extremes in summer 2018. And we know that human activities have approximately doubled the risk of a heat wave like that happening, those kind of temperature extremes uh, in recent years. And again, during the occurrence of that event, people were saying, oh, sure, what's new? We've had a heat wave and drought in 1976. Nothing new in the world. Well, here's a comparison of 1976, and this is the temperature anomalies or how extreme that heat wave event was, and the spatial fingerprint of heat wave events in 1976. This is 2018. So you can see really clearly how human activities are just providing the background warming so that when extreme events happen, they're more extreme. And look at the spatial fingerprint of the amount of the world that's experiencing those kind of extremes. And you remember Storm Desmond in 2015-16, and we're able to ask the question, what impact did human activities have on that storm event? And we're able to show from analysis that we've done that that storm spent more time over warmer waters that are driven by increasing water temperatures from human activities that resulted in more moisture being put into that storm. So when it reached the west coast of Ireland, it delivered record amounts of rainfall. So there's a human fingerprint even in the rainfall, the wettest December we've ever recorded in this country from Storm Desmond in 2015. And in those storm events themselves, we've seen some remarkable years. This is 2013-14 which was from analysis we've done in trying to reconstruct storms all the way back to the 1870s, the stormiest winter we've ever had in this part of the world. A combination of the frequency and intensity of the storm event. And we can see when we look at these long records, I won't dwell on this, this was put in at the last minute, so we see in particularly in winter, we see this increase in intensity or strength of storms over the North Atlantic. Other conditions around storms, like the number of them, is hard to pull out of a trend, but in winter we've seen an increase in the intensity of storms over the last century or so. So climate is changing globally, climate is changing in Ireland, we have evidence, more than enough evidence, so what about the future? 
And again, like asking the question, what's causing this? We need to think about the future, and we have to go back to our computer models. And this on the left-hand side is just a representation of, of how those models operate. Then they are physically based. They are some of the biggest supercomputers of any scientific endeavor that we undertake as humans. And it takes a lot of processing power to run these. I couldn't do I use the outputs from them rather than running them. And really detailed representation of how our climate system works. And we have many of them. So we run those in order to understand the future with different scenarios. So what if we continue emitting greenhouse gases as we do at present and continue that into the future? What might happen? What if we all agree to these international targets to reduce greenhouse gases back to pre-1990 levels or even below hand, or keep global warming to no more than two degrees? And we can run those scenarios and ask what happens in the future as a result of that. And that's how we use climate models, to ask questions of the future. What if we continue to emit? What if we make dramatic changes? And the models, as a first port of call, when you're using something like this, you have to ask, is it able to capture reality? These are the black line is the observed temperatures, the red line are climate model temperatures, and they do a good job of capturing global temperature. Sometimes not so great at other variables, but in key ones at global scales, they do a very good job. And here's what they show us about the future. And I'm going to show two lines in each of these graphs. The red is business as usual, and the blue is where we do make big changes to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions at a global scale to stay within what's considered safe, don't like that word, but that's what it is, no amount of warming is safe, but two, below two degrees Celsius globally, which are the international agreements which are now in place. And the difference is stark in terms of the future. So if we run our models out to the end of the century, the right hand side is business as usual. On average, this is a four degree warmer world, but you can see how warm the land surface is, how hot the Arctic is relative to present, we're talking in the Arctic, seven to eight degrees Celsius warmer than present. Parts of land surface around Europe, we think about the heat waves in France this year, we're talking about again, five degrees Celsius warmer than present. With business as usual, doing nothing, keeping going as we're going. This is the more optimistic future where we enact change and you can see dramatically the differences, the same color schemes. This one is a much cooler future. It's a world that is about two degrees Celsius warmer we still see the greatest land warming over land and at higher um, latitudes in the Arctic, but in this case we're at about 1.5 degrees and maybe three to four degrees in the high Arctic region. So big differences in terms of the future, in terms of what we choose to do and what, how that may unfold. <coughs> when it comes to sea level rise, again, same orange is business as usual. The blue is if we get our act together on greenhouse gas emissions. At the end of the century, we expect a global sea level rise in the order of about 0.8 of a metre. Uh, on the optimistic scenario, we expect about 0.4 of a metre. But again, you'll notice this spread. We just talk about a mean, but all of this is possible. Again, that has implications for many coastal regions. I'll show you an example of work we're doing in Wexford at the moment around how coastal change is affecting communities. And in terms of these future outlooks, I asked a question and I've talked about memorable seasonal extremes in an er earlier slide. We can revisit them here and ask, well, how frequent might that driest summer on record be by the end of the century under business as usual? We expect one in seven years to be as dry as our driest summer on record by the end of the century if we keep going business as usual. We expect similarly our wettest winter on record to be one in every seven years by the end of the century. When we talk about our hottest summer on record, this one takes a bit of explaining. If we continue greenhouse gas emissions, business as usual, by the end of the century, our hottest summer on record will be a cool summer by the end of the record. But only one in 10 years will be anywhere as cool as our current hottest summer on record, or thereabouts. So we see a dramatic change in the occurrence of heat extremes. <coughs> So the question has emerged globally based on these kind of results, what is an acceptable level of risk? This is what the international negotiations are about and the targets that you read about is, what is an acceptable level of risk? And in 2015, <coughs> countries of the world met in Paris and agreed that it is sensible that we try to limit global mean temperature increase to no more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial, 
when we're already one degree halfway there, and to attempt to try to maintain global temperatures at no more than one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial. Because as we go beyond two degrees Celsius, it's not that the light switch goes off, a dramatic change happens at 2.1 degrees, but the risk from extreme events increases. As we go beyond two degrees Celsius, the risk to unique and threatened ecosystems increases, the risk from extreme events increases, the unequal distribution of impacts increases, the overall economic cost globally becomes exorbitant, and there's a risk as we go beyond two degrees, well beyond two degrees, of the risk of large-scale surprise events in the climate system. So we agreed as part of the global agreements, the Paris agreements, to adhere to these goals and to put in place plans globally to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in order to stay within those targets. <coughs> and here's what those greenhouse gas emissions look like. And I'm nearly there. This is where we are in terms of gigatons, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You don't need to worry about the magnitudes, it's the, the lines that are important. This is our business as usual, just keeping going as we're going, the rep gives us that four degree warmer world by the end of the century. This is where we need to get to in terms of maintaining global temperatures at no more than two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial. This is where we were after the Paris Agreement, where countries wrote an intention, and I'll emphasize that word, an intention to commit that amount of reductions in greenhouse gases. These are not actual reductions in greenhouse gases, their intentions to reduce the countries have signed up to. They are still nowhere near getting us to two degree safety margin in terms of global mean temperature. And indeed, our greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere are continuing to increase in following this line as we, start, as we speak at the moment. So, to conclude or begin to wrap up, climate change is real, it's happening, but the future is in our hands, and there's lots we can do, and I'm very happy to pick that up in discussion or questions, but we have a lot of work to do to bend the curves from that orange line for the future to that blue line for the future. But climate action needs reduction in our greenhouse gases. If we want to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we need to reduce our emissions of greenhouse gases and we need to adapt to the change that's going to happen. We are already committed to climate change. Climate, our carbon dioxide exists in the atmosphere for many decades. The emissions that are all already up there are going to increase temperatures over, they have, we're one degree already since pre-industrial, and we're already committed to a certain amount of warming. And we've seen the change in floods, we've seen the change in rainfall, and we have to make sure we adapt our systems to do that. That's what Paddy said at the start, we're working with agencies that are responsible for this kind of infrastructure to make sure that they're climate proof. And even if we take success in terms of global policy in the future and we keep global temperatures to two degrees Celsius, we do still see an increase in the risk of floods and we do still see an increase in the risk of drought. This is a picture of Europe of a world that is two degrees Celsius. On the left hand side are changes in floods where the oranges are increases in floods. You can see Ireland shows increases in floods even at two degrees Celsius. And on the right hand side is the duration. These are for drought events on the right hand side. And you can see even at two degrees Celsius or low flow events in catchments, particularly in the south of the country, you see an increase in the duration of low flow conditions. So as well as reducing greenhouse gas emissions, we have to also adapt to the changes that are and will happen will happen. I'm not going to depress it. I'm going to move on from that. And again, thinking about how climate change impacts communities, it's not just about the direct impacts. This is the study I talked about in Cortown. I grew up in Gorey. And the Cortown I remember from my childhood was this Cortown and the postcard, with a great big beach and a bustling community developed around that beach and tourism. And over the course of the last 15 years or so, this is what that beach has turned into. Through a combination of storms, poor management, I'm not saying this is all climate change, but it's a component to it in terms of sea level rise, changes in storminess, but also bad management. And the community in Core Town are now looking at a future in which this beach is utterly changed and trying to imagine what the future is for Core Town in terms of how it reimagines itself and how it adapts to these changes. So there are communities that are already on the front line and learning how they are responding to this change will be hugely valuable to other communities around the country. 
And indeed, adapting to change is not without its own problems. This is the community in Clontarf in Dublin, which I was involved in a study with, and it's their response to building of flood walls around the seafront in Clontarf. And some people castigate them and say, oh, you're going to flood anyway, but place is important to people. The environment in which they live is important to people. If you look at the letters that were written by this community to Dublin City Council in protest, it was about their childhood memories and how loss of place through building of flood defences impacts all that. So there are ways in which we don't often think about the climate change and our response to climate change can impact on communities. And understanding place as a geographer is really important to that. So I'm hitting 50 minutes, my conclusion. Climate change presents us with challenges of both mitigation and adaptation, how we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but also how we adapt to future change. Every action that we take matters, and in every individual matters, but the transformation ahead needs to be just, bring everybody with the change, and inclusive. And that, I can't remember what the last part was. That was yeah. the climax to finish up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening, and if any questions. I know a lot of people, are, a lot of us are not used to seeing so many graphs and models and diagrams and so on, but I think Connor did a great job at explaining them, yeah. or explaining most of them to us. So, but, and I'm sure as a result, you, a lot of you might have, some of you might have <coughs> questions to ask, and he's quite happy to take questions. <coughs>